Hi, this is Mark Lentin, sometimes actor, sometimes author, always singer-songwriter, telling you about a new series we're starting for thehitlist.net. That's T-H-E-H-I-T-T-L-I-S-T dot net, uh, called Hollywood Confidential. And it's featuring Raymond Rusty Strait. We, uh, we've known each other for about two years, but I was reading Ray Strait's books in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Ray Strait is easily one of the most fascinating people you'll ever meet. Uh, he's been uh, an intimate of Hollywood stars for over 40 years, especially Hollywood stars of the classic era. And uh, he's going to give us insight and some stories that you will, I promise you, have never heard anywhere else. So please tune in. It's called Hollywood Confidential, and it's only on the hit list, T-H-E-H-I-T-T-L-A-S-T dot net. Thanks. So uh, it's an honor. I'm sitting here with, we know you as Rusty Strait, but uh, any of his fans will know him as Raymond Ray Strait. And I just got to tell you quickly that I was reading Ray Strait's books in 1977, 78, 79 with a group called Nostalgia Book Club. And here comes 40 years later, and I met a guy whose books I was reading four decades before. And it's a, it's a real treat. But the, you have lived enough for about three lives. But we're just going to focus on the Hollywood portion and what we're calling Hollywood Confidential because you have a million great stories. It was very funny how I met you. Yes. Do you want to tell that story? You want me to? Well, well uh, no, you tell it. You tell okay. it better than I do. Well, it, this is and this is exactly how it happened. I, I uh, was uh, hired as a, a string, what they call a stringer. I hadn't uh, I, I run a couple of magazines, a couple of newspapers, and written for them. And I just wanted a little side job. So the, uh, the Valley Chronicle, as the newspaper was known at the time here in Hemet, Hemet, California, uh, I'm sitting there with the old editor, Chris Smith, who's introducing me. He says, hey, this guy's got a couple of degrees, and he's great. And here's Tom Jones, and, and here's this guy, and this is Mark Lentine, and you guys are going to love him. And he comes to, of course, who else is sitting at the head of the table but Rusty, Ray Strait. So, uh, and he says, and this is Ray. And he says, my name's Ray Strait. How you doing, fella? Nice to meet you. I shake his hand. And I looked at him for a second and I thought, can't be. I said, you know, back in the late 70s and 80s, there was a group called the Nostalgia Book Club run out of New York. And this guy, there was, he was one of only two guys that we looked for his books and looked for his interviews. One was Bob Osborne and then the other was a guy named Ray Strait. But of course, by now he'd be dead. And before I could say dead, I said, Rusty said, it's going to be 95. It's going to be 95 this May. This you're, May and you're looking you're at looking him. Looking at him. How the hell are you, kid? And I nearly, <laughs> dropped, I took a picture. He, does, he didn't know this, so I told him, but I took my cell phone and took, took it from under my table I took a picture up at him at the, at the head of the table and sent it to my buddy uh, back east, Al, who um, we, were, we were kids, literally 10 and 11 years old, movie fans. And I couldn't believe that that was this guy. But Rusty, we could talk about Rusty's army career, the Air Force. Uh, he knew Paul Tibbetts. Uh, who dropped the bomb, right? You were yeah. there in Tinian, in the island. Of Paul Tennessee. used to uh, play pinnacle with the stem on the flight line. So I, I literally, when I say he's lived enough for three lives, maybe four, uh, he has. We're going to focus on Rusty's immense, intense, incredible uh, career in Hollywood and with notables from the late 40s, mid to late 40s on. He knew them all. Uh, I just wanted to show you a few books uh, this is a Mar the Mary Lodge book. And real quick, I know we're not going to dwell on this, but you, you have some interesting ideas about his death. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing with, with his death, that uh, was the guy that was murdered one, and they, and they sent him back to, they, he was, had to go back to Italy. Anyway, he was Lucky trying. Lucky Luciano. Uh, Lucky Luciano. He was trying to get back to the United States, and he was doing a lot of charity work. Yes. And he came to Mario's home in Italy, and told him, he said, uh, I, I would like you to come and do a charity benefit that it's for kids. And he was going on and on. And Mario said, yes, I'll do it. Well, later, Mario got wind of what was going on and he backed out. And so there was a guy who came with a 
funny nose and his hat. <laughs> and he said, you'll either do this or there'll be, you'll never record another, another album. Well, what happened, the day of the event, Mario was in the hospital, sick, of course, and his wife, Betty, took the kids and a stack of records to the, to the uh, arena, and they were going to sell his records. And it was, a, it was just a, a bust, total bust. So Mario, at the hospital, his faithful chauffeur was with him all the time, they found Mario the next morning with a tube in his arm and nothing but air going in. And um, his, uh, the nurse disappeared and the, the uh, chauffeur disappeared. They never saw either one of them ever again. And that's how, when you deal with the mob, what can happen to you. It doesn't matter how big a star you are. Jeez. That's See, now, now you know why we call it Hollywood Confidential. Uh, this one is another, and I'm telling you, he's the got- The worst book I ever did. He's got 36, 37 books, and this, you said, is the worst book the, ever, the and worst the hardest book. interview. I so remember- Alan Alda, by the way, if you can't say it. Alan, I started the book, I, I, St. Martin's gave me the assignment, then they told me to stop because um, Alan wanted to work with me. Well, I'd done set up a lot of interviews at Fox Studios because working for Jane Mansfield, I knew Fox very well and I knew all the PR people over there. And uh, all of a sudden, he said no, and he tried to stop all of the interviews I, that, that I had set up. So I did a lot of subterranean interviews, no names mentioned. Gotcha. And he was the worst, it was the worst disaster in my life. And when the Times book editor, Bill, I, Bill, I can't remember his last name, first name was Bill, he, he said, don't waste your 1495, and when he reviewed the book, and I sent him an email right away, and, uh, uh, not an email, a message, and said, I couldn't agree more. Right. So it, even though it's your name on it, you, you, you said it was a bust because he wouldn't participate. He, he, he wasn't was anything he represented himself to do. I interviewed his mother, and boy, the story she told me was a totally different story than he told me. Yikes. But the book we want to start out with today, uh, and we're going to do this series every week. It'll be on thehitlist.net. And, uh, and I'm blessed, by the way, to know the, the greatest writer I think I could have ever known in Jim Hitt and the greatest storyteller I could have ever known in Rusty. You, when you read Jim's books, you hear poetry. And when you read Rusty's books, you hear you and Rusty around a fire sitting there having a beer. We're storytellers. Two different, two different uh, attacks on writing, but two wonderful, uh, uh, two, two wonderful uh, writers. But this book is amazing. And tell us, it's called The Tragic Life of Jane Mansfield. You can get it at Post Hill Press. And we've got to get you a website. We've got to get you a website. But you can look up the, I this, have a website. this interview and others at uh, thehitlist.net. But tell us, how did you, how did you come about? Why did, was it reissued? Why was the book reissued? Well, it's been, it's, it's been issued. Originally, it was in hardcover from Regnery. And then it was, uh, the next it came, the English version. And then... Uh, another SPI, they did it. Uh, here they are, Jane Mansfield, and that, that was my title I gave it because it was I stole that from um, a, ra a radio uh, guy that I mean a TV guy that was uh, with Jack Parr, and he had his own talk show. Like it, 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 you know who he is, the late night that only the big celebrities was with him. Oh, at night, uh, yeah. Tom Snyder? No, 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 no. The guy we talked about the other day at my house. Um, Dick, Dick, Cavett. Dick Cavett and Dick Cavett once said when introducing on the Jack Parr show introducing Jane he said here they are Jane Mansfield <laughs> and I thought that was a, an apropos title for a book and then the, you know people bother the hell out of me I can't talk to them he is at 90 by the way Rusty is 96 and at 96 he is still in, he runs rings around me and is busier than oh, the next three people. This guy's got than more me. problems than, than the medical society. Uh, but no, so, with this, and then, then he came out uh, and it was done on, um, on uh, let's see, on, on Kindle and, and, um, okay. and audio. And uh, so then I got this one and this publisher is more proud and led to blow him up. 
Now, how many guys, you know, write a book again? And, and no, have I got, I got one, one royalty statement in a year, and it was all their money. I can get anything. <laughs> let me... <laughs> But let, let me ask you, how did you, <laughs> you want the truth? That's the truth. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't varnish much. The, uh, uh, I'm but, not in the paint business. Let me let me ask you, how? Uh, let's take you back to the beginning. So, how does this self-proclaimed hillbilly coming out of West Virginia, a holler, uh, a holler? How did you? How did you even get in a position to to meet Jane Mansfield to begin with? But here's the interesting thing. Before, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you said you, you, she looked like she needed a friend? Well, what happened was this. I was working for the Southern Pacific Railroad in Houston. Paul Mansfield, her estranged husband, also worked there. Okay. He was in the publicity department. I worked in transportation. He, um, one day some of the kids said, Paul's wife is a movie star. Well, I'd never heard of Jane Mansfield, couldn't have cared less. And uh, she got a new movie coming out. We're all going to go tonight. I said, well, I'm going to go see. Paul was kind of a dingy guy anyway. I said, I don't want to see any woman he'd be married to. And they said, well, oh, no, this is a rock and roll. It's from 20th Century Fox. Oh. And, and I was very much into rock and roll. This was back in 1950, late 56, I think. And so um, finally they convinced me to go. And the minute Jane Mansfield hit the screen, the very thought hit me in right, right between the eyes. You need to go see her. She needs a friend. That's the first thing you thought. That's my first thought. So it had nothing to do with the character she was portraying. Just nothing to about do. Her presence. I, I thought that she was being miserably used by the wrong people and she needed a friend. The next day, I put in a transfer to Los Angeles from Houston. Okay. Two weeks later, I came to Los Angeles. Two weeks after I got here, I was stationed doing a stenotype, and I was taking reports at plane cr of uh, train crashes okay. and any wrecks on the railroad. I gave them two weeks' notice. I'd only been here a couple of weeks. I gave two weeks' notice, and, um, and I quit the job. I had no other job coming up. But one of the kids, I was living in the famous Argyle apartments for yes. a, lot, a lot of uh, young actors. Up and coming, right. Yeah, and so one of the kids, Tom Abernathy, I remember his name well, he said, do you like to work in, in the industry? Well, when anybody talks about the industry in Hollywood, they mean movies. Mean, right. And so I said, sure, I'd love it. He said, well, there's a lady named Billy Cooper at Life Employment downtown Los Angeles. And uh, go down there and she make an appointment, go see her, because she finds jobs for kids in the movies. I said, fine. I went down, she didn't have anything. She told me to come back next week. Well, I went in one morning and she said, I think it was on a Tuesday morning, Tuesday. And she said, what do you know about business management? Well, I didn't know anything about business management. I'd been for, to a couple of business colleges, but that was all about accounting. Right. I had no idea what business management meant. And I always figured if I got my foot in the door, I'd make it. Yeah. So I said, oh, a lot. <laughs> Brass monkey, you know, and uh, so, <laughs> so she said, "Well, he out on Sunset Boulevard, out on the Strip, and he's a business manager, and he's looking for a male secretary. Well, you don't see anybody looking for male or female. They just it's just a secretary today. Right. Anyhow, I said okay. So I went out and was interviewed by him on his name was Charles Goldring. He had a lot of screenwriters, Goldring, a lot yeah. of screenwriters." And he said, um, well, Ray, I can tell you, I yell a lot. I looked at him, I said, Mr. Golding, I spent six years in the military. I've been yelled at by experts. <laughs> he hired me. I went to work on Monday morning. Now, he had an office upstairs. It was like kind of a Swiss chalet office building. And, uh, and I had, I, my office was a little cubicle at the foot of the stairs. And he called upstairs the lion's den because you could hear him roaring. <laughs> That was what he was talking about. I yelled a lot. And Tuesday morning, the next morning, my second day there, I looked up and who was one in to tinkle at the little restroom right across from my office. All this pink. I thought I knew who it was. And when she came back out, I'm sure who it was. Yeah. That was my introduction, Jane Mansell. She went upstairs. And when she came downstairs, she stopped at my desk and said, you must be Charlie's new secretary. 
I said, yes, ma'am. She says, what's your name? I said, Ray Street. She says, well, my, I'm Jane Mansfield. I'm a movie star. Would you like to help me with my fan mail a, on the weekend? That, that was, was my the first answer. word she said. That's the first word she said. And I said, yes. Well, I did fan mail for a couple of days. And I was with her for 10 years till she died. And you now, just to, before we actually get into the... Uh, what is that thing doing? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove that right now. It's just a little screen icon. Sorry, guys. So, but, but, so here's the interesting, before we get into the book, you were supposed to be with her the night she died. The only reason I was, I was married at the time, and my wife was pregnant, because I had been with her to Biloxi Ford, Gus Stevens Supper Club. We'd had a wonderful time there in 1963. Right? We had a great time there. And I went with her everywhere. But um, she's, her and my wife, Angel, got together and, and decided that Angel, Jane and I should have a fight. And so Jane picked an argument with me, so I wouldn't be going. Then she gets down there and says, I wish you were here. <laughs> and if I had been there, I wouldn't have been a 18, 19 year old kid trying to, 85 miles an hour trying to impress a movie star, because I've never been impressed by a movie star. Just because they make more money than I do, don't mean they do the job any better. Right, right? and this kid who was driving. And he, the three people in the front seat were, were killed and the three kids in the back seat, only Mickey Jr. had a broken arm. And one of the kids in the back seat was the very famous Marishka Hargitay. Who you know and-, and Who I know and may be doing a book with. Right, hopefully. And you, you also know her son. You, son, you know him as Zoli, but it's Zoltan. Zoltan, I know Zoltan and Mickey Jr. and Tony. Now here's the interesting thing. You told me too the night about the night of that crash that at some point, for some reason, she stopped and put... Oh, she, uh, Zoltan told me about this, and I, I didn't know when I wrote the book, that on the way from Biloxi to, to New Orleans, they were going to New Orleans so she wouldn't have to get up in, so early in the morning to yeah. drive up. Okay. And she often did that. It was nearby the city with television. And Zoltan told me that her and her boyfriend, Sam Brody, got into an argument, and she made him stop the car, and Zoli got in the back, in the front seat, and she got in the back seat. They drove along a little while and they made up and she stopped the car and put him back in the back seat. Otherwise, he would have been killed in the front seat. My gosh. So, the whole thing from the time I first saw her till I got to meet her was almost like everything was planned. That, and one time we were coming back uh, on a plane flight from somewhere and I said, Jane, you know, I don't like the way this plane is acting. It was bouncing all over the sky, very turbulent. And she says, oh, well, when you travel as much as I do, the law of averages catch up with you. I said, sweetheart, when your law of averages catch up with you, I don't want to be with you. And as it worked out, very fatalistic, I wasn't. That whole thing would seem to be a choreography. My whole life with Jane seemed to have been choreographed from, choreographed from somewhere else. And, and so, but there was a higher hand or something. That it was there was something hand. there because the minute I saw her, I knew I was intended to know her. That's on that screen, that moment. That moment, the minute she, minute they showed her and she flashed up on the screen, I knew that I had to meet her. That's amazing. I felt she needed a friend and I would need that friend. And it was 10, ten years, you were 13 years. 10 years until she was no longer existent. And now, so the book, the reissue came about because the... the uh, oh, well, it came out in paperback first and then it came out in, in, in um, another paperback and it's just about four or five times it's been issue, an issue. And here's the interesting thing, um, that, that the people that you, I mean, you've met and, and interviewed Jeff Bridges and- uh, Love uh, Jeff, he's, he's a real person. And George Clooney, and we could go on. And I mean, hundreds and hundreds of- So well, I did a book with his aunt Rosemary. Uh, who was, I always loved Rosemary Clooney, and she said, she is the what, godmother? She's the godmother to my two boys. And my, your son, Mark, I, I thought it was hilarious. He said she had the biggest house and that bedroom you could have played football. Yeah, in. she had the biggest. Well, in Hollywood, bedroom is where things go on. Everything well, takes activity. Sitting on the bed, laying on the bed. Deals. Everything happens in the bedroom in Hollywood. That's uh, Everything. James has every star I've ever known conduct a business in the bedroom. Really? Yeah, that's especially the women. That, that's so now, what does the reissue have, and, and what, what, do, what do you There's have nothing to say new. about the book? There's or? nothing new in here. Uh, I thought about doing a book, you know, 50 years later. She's been dead 50 years. Yeah, 67, right? 67. 67. Yeah, 53 years. 53 my years, my God. 
And you know, I'm, I guess I'm just never going to get old. I just keep doing this. No, stuff. he's just, I told you, he's still, he's still going strong. But uh, is there anything that you could add that wasn't in the book? Things I don't, you well, were always, I, I gotta about, say, you were always known as not trashy stuff that was just in there for titillation. Well, the trashy but, stuff but, I wrote under a different right, name. Right. <laughs> but your, your stuff was always good and true and honest. So, but is there anything that you... To this day with the paper, I, I, don't, I don't write dishonest stuff. Anymore. No, it's just I'm a people, straight ahead. Right. Jim can tell you, I'm a pe people writer. I, I, I relate to people. Oh, yeah, that's your stuff. I, I would recommend even growing up hillbilly. It's just, you can't put it down. It's just so, it's just so interesting. And you want to find out what happened to this, that just starts out, little kid, and, and goes on. But uh, From the holler to Hollywood, how's from that? From the holler, there you go. That, that would be a wonderful, because it's the truth. Did, uh, you know something, I'm going to tell you something sure. about Hollywood. That, when I first came to Hollywood, it was I'd been to California several times before that, oh, okay. before Avenue J. But my first time when I came out here in the early 40s, 42 or 40, 43, I think it was, used to see Ronald Coleman and his wife window shopping on Hollywood Boulevard. And out on, out, out on Sunset, I ran into Gladys George. Oh, wonderful uh, character wonderful, actress. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. And you, you would, it was, wasn't unusual to run into stars walking around and in stores and things, Red Skelton. I was in, in Wallach's Music City. Love and all of a sudden, Skelton. I looked to see who was going through re the records. With their, next to me, Red, Red Skelton. And Wallach's was a famous record store. They it had was, the, music it was the most famous record store in Hollywood. Right, interesting. Uh, and uh, Capitol Records was next door, the old Capitol Records for the really? Minter Tower, yeah. Before the, uh, for, so they had the, the recording booth and everything. The they had core records in there, was up in there somewhere, and 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 and, uh, and Capitol was right next door to Wallet's Music City. So you could have seen if you had, were time, your timing was good. You could have seen Sinatra going in to record. Well, I saw Sinatra a lot of times later. <laughs> it's the start of a, of a series of interviews we're going to do. I somebody I just tickled to know. I still, every time I see you, I think I'm getting to see a guy who 40 years. That's all right, my son. <laughs> <laughs> who 40 plus years ago, I was reading and you know, I love it. And you but know, I'm I, still getting royalties from some well, of those you should, books. You should, you should. And you really, for, look, for, for movie lovers like us, we're movie geeks. Uh, I am, and, you know, my friends are. But uh, I, I just think to get to know the lady, the person who was Jane Mansfield and the star was Jane Mansfield, we, we need to dig into this book more. So we're going to do some follow-up interviews, but this is the book. Again, it is Post Hill Press. Uh, you can find our interviews on thehitlist.net. And, um, you know, we, we may start marketing books and other things at some point, but you're really, uh, we're, we're, we're going to close it up. If, before we, we close this interview, I, I would, what would you, if you had to, one sentence or one idea, Rusty, uh, if you wanted people to take away something about Jane Mansfield, what would it be? Uh, she was everything that people thought she wasn't. That's a mouthful. She was everything. You know, the original, the original title was not a tragic life. My original title was More Than an Image. I love that title. I, that I was my that title. title. But, you know, publishers have their own weird little people that work back in little cubby holes and make the decision to just, that run your life. Right. But okay. you know what happens to older writers? They just sit back and talk about their past and collect their royalties. And, <laughs> now, but, and, and, and we do want to wind up, but I have to say that you said she was an intensely bright, very She was 163 woman. IQ, and would you know that Marilyn Monroe, who I also know a lot about, was 160 IQ. Right, so she had three more points. Yeah, and, and, and Jane had a couple of bigger points, too. <laughs> Well, we're going to wrap this up, and we hope you've enjoyed this first of many interviews with uh, Ray Rusty Strait on uh, Hollywood Confidential. Uh, again, you will find these interviews on, on the hitlist.net, and we thank you for joining I us. want to say hello to my friend Jim Go ahead. Hitt. Jim Hitt. Jim, I love you. Jim, you know that. Bless you. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you again. All right, guys, that was terrific. Uh, I've got a lot of work, lot to work with there, and it will take me a day. How time you got to work? Yeah, well, I, you know, uh, I'm going to try to make you as beautiful as I can, Ray. Uh, <laughs> well, I know what you'll do. 
So, so Jim, we'll, we'll shoot for maybe next week. I'll leave it up to you as to when I'll clear the decks time-wise. And I think we'll do it in my gazebo. And we'll try it next. You want to do okay. it Thursday at 5? Is that good for you? Thursday at 5 is Is that good for you, Jim? That's fine. That's a good time, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we'll, 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 you and I getting together and talking about the rest of the, the site and the books and things, we can do that whenever it's good for you next week when it cools down a little. I don't care when you do it. All right. All, All right. right. We'll, we'll see you guys. Bye.